Hello, everyone. I'm joining you from not so sunny uh, United Kingdom at the moment, just north of London. It's pretty grey and miserable and horrible, and and but a reasonable time in the morning, so about nine thirty. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much for, to Yao for inviting me again to to speak. It's probably my favourite conference in the world, actually. I've, I think I've been on three Yao tours now in total, so doing the the three cities. And it's it's the highlight of my year every time I do it. So um, thanks very much for inviting me back. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thanks for those kind words uh, in your introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm going to um, talk today about, um, it's, it's sort of an ongoing conversation I've been having with people around the impact of complexity science and some of the underlying principles of, of complex adaptive systems and sp specifically how they relate to uh, software architectures. So things like coupling, cohesion, how systems um, are put together in the large, I guess. And uh, apparently every time you say team topologies in the area, you have to have a drink now. Um, so I've got a coffee, it's a bit early for me for a beer. So, and team topologies, how teams fit together um, and optimize for flow, so drink. Hope they'll run out because I'm probably going to say it a few times. Um, but I'm going to start with, um, I guess, a bit of the background to why I got interested in these topics. And that's to say, back in about 2014, um, Martin Farrell and myself, we wrote uh, a paper on, on microservices. So um, this is, I guess, the original definition of microservices. And we said, even though there's not a formal definition of microservices, we'll give it a go. There are a number of characteristics that we feel we can sort of call out that teams that organizations that are doing doing microservices in some form um, are sort of exhibiting mostly all of these things to be successful. Um, and the interesting thing is, as you know, time has gone on um, and the microservices architectural style has become more popular, so popularized by people like Sam Newman and his excellent book, Building Microservices, which I believe is the second edition is either out or coming out soon, so I'm going to go and have a look, have a look at that. Um, as it's become more popular, I think we've sort of been able to see a few more interesting characteristics, or maybe have, have a deeper understanding of how some of the characteristics relate to one another. Um, so if we just go to the characteristics that themselves that Martin Fowler and myself discussed, we talked about a number of things, you know, some some architecture, some code, so componentization by services, talked about evolutionary design, so not deciding everything up front and then winning the least, talked about infrastructure automation, the importance of that, design for failure and that, you've got distributed systems, you have to think about different failure modes than you do when you've got a single monolith. Um, but we also talked about sort of, sort of quite large scale concepts, almost enterprise, architect enterprise architecture like con concepts around things like organized around business capabilities, decentralization of governance, products, not projects. Um, and as, as I said, the componentization by services, very similar to the, the SOA that came previously. But what do we actually mean when we say things like organized around business capabilities or products, not projects? What is a business capability, for example? Um, and one of the interesting questions I've been pondering recently is what differentiates, say, organization around a business capability from organization around a banded context in domain-driven design terms or a subdomain in domain-driven design terms. Um, what, are they the same thing? Or are they different things? Um, and I think we're starting to get some idea now of what, uh, what business capabilities are and differ, how they differ from those key domain-driven design terms. Um, simply for me, a business capability is not just the, the bounded context that's running software, that's an implementation of an abstract thing that's called a, a subdomain and domain driven design. But a business capability instead is a bit of a wider thing, a bit of a bigger thing. So when we say organized around business capabilities, we mean teams organized around stable parts of your business. So whether that's you know, sort of, uh, fulfillment in retail, whether that's um, you know, sort of, uh, you know, shipping, whether that's sales, um, and those things, uh, those, those sort of stable parts of your business are composed not just of software, but they're also composed of people and processes as well. And this is why we'll touch a little bit on team topologies in a moment. Drink. Because team topology talks about things like streamlined teams. And what, are they, what does that actually mean? What, is, what does a streamlined team actually mean? 
But the main thing that these thing, these four characteristics have in common is this idea of decentralization. It's the idea of pushing things out to the boundaries. It's the idea of um, splitting big things up uh, into smaller things and pushing things like governance to those smaller constructs. Um, and having these constructs as loosely coupled from one another as possible. Of course, we need some coupling. Without some coupling, you can't do any work. You know, if you have, well, I guess maybe an example of a software system that isn't coupled to anything at all might be a stateless computer game, which might be, you know, if we go back to the 80s, that might be a thing, but probably isn't so much these days. Um, but, you know, a web application without access to any sort of store or state uh, is, is not much of an application. So um, you need some coupling, but what is the minimum amount of coupling that we need when we're talking about software? So that's really what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this um, this, this 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 talk of mine. Um, we'll be looking at some of the underlying similarities between software architecture, team topologies. I'm going to get tired of drinking, so I'm just going to stop that joke right now. Um, but hey, thanks for sharing. Uh, but team topologies. It used, to, by the way, it used to be Kinevin. That was what that was the speaker's joke previously. Whenever whenever someone said the Kinevin framework, you had to have a drink. Um, and I, I'm allowed to say Kinevin because I'm Welsh, so much like Dave, Dave Snowden, I'm, I can actually pronounce it properly. Anyway, so the underlying connections between software architecture, team topologies, decentralization, and this idea of complexity and complex adaptive systems. So first of all, let's take a look at uh, a, a, a brief look at some of this, some of the ideas from team topologies. So one of the interesting things about team topologies um, and the reason I'm allowed to talk about it, I think, in, 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 in this talk, is because there's a circular reference going on. So actually, uh, Team Topologies, the book, references a lot of my previous work and my colleague Evan Botcher's in, in Australia's work around things like the inverse Conway manoeuvre. So I'm, I'm now going to reference Team Topologies. So now no one is going to know where the references started or ended. We're going to end up with this kind of loop, uh, this sort of Ouroboros, if you like, of references eating their own tails between microservices and team topologies. I hope that's okay. Um, I actually had a similar thing. There was a similar thing with microservices itself. I saw a keynote by an um, amazing speaker, Chris O'Dell. She's now at, at Apple. Um, and she was looking at the origins of microservices and trying to find out where, where the name microservices comes from, leads you to Wikipedia, then to a scientific paper, and then to Martin's website, which leads you back to uh, a scientific paper, which leads you back to this is kind of loop going around. So we're going to do the same thing with team topologies. I hope that's okay. So I'm going to start off this little bit with a quote, which is from someone at an event I was very lucky to be at in, uh, in, in on the Caribbean island of Anguilla. And this person was working works for Amazon Web Services, and they say he said during the course of a conversation about Conway's law, um, it's really interesting. But, but at, at Amazon Web Services, the more people we add, the more products we build, and the bigger we get, the easier it is to get bigger. So the more people we add on, the more people, um, it's, it's easier to add more people. Now, I thought that was a really interesting idea and it kind of flies in the face somewhat of, um, of, of, of what you think about when you think about scaling organizations and adding teams or adding people. We tend to think that adding people will slow things down over time. Um, and that's, um, that's uh, this, I'm, I'm getting distracted by chat here, but, um, but yes, it was at Dave's house. Uh, just to kind of nudge, um, it wasn't Dave's house and Um But uh, this, this, this person came up with this quote about how easy it was for Amazon, for Amazon Web Services to scale, flying in the face somewhat of, um, of, of the sort of expected behavior as organizations get bigger. So what is it about team topologies that I find super interesting? Well, for me, I've been thinking about, and this is really why microservices is interesting to me as well. I've been thinking a lot about the idea of flow. How, how work flows within organizations, how work flows from idea into production, whether that's in knowledge work, which is the stuff that I guess pretty much most of the people who are, who are watching me at the moment do, whether that's turning, you know, kind of a, a project pr product, a product idea into working software or into something that we can sell, or in fact, actually the flow of goods. So the flow of physical material, how does physical stuff flow from origin to, to end point. So whether that's you know, raw materials that gets that harvested and then turned into a pro physical product that's sold um, after going through a number of product development stages in a factory. So this is the sort of thing that for me that has been that's sort of common across lots of different um, domains that I've been I've been looking into recently. Um, I, I I sort of had this interesting sort of insight into this where I was at a very large retailer. 
um, in Spain. And that retailer, they're amazing. They, their supply chain operations are so, so good. Like extraordinarily, um, the, the flow of, um, of, 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 of material from literally from, you know, from, from cloth into a store is so efficient that they can go from the designer putting their pen down to that design being in stores 15 days later. Which is uh, in, which is incredible, really. But then you looked at an IT organisation that was part of the, the, you know, the same part, the same organisation, and in order to get you know, requirements from idea into working with software, could take months and months and months. And what I could, what I can't work out is why people can't see the similarities between these two things. So um, I'm going to essentially make a statement now, which is the goal of successful organisational design and in terms of things like how you structure your teams, how you structure departments and divisions, um, how you structure the way information flows. The goal of successful organizational design is to optimize the flow of value and pretty much all else is subordinate to that. Um, this is kind of similar, of course, to the theory of constraints. And this is really, again, what team topologies drink is talking a lot about. It's about how we optimize teams to organize this and optimize this flow of value. And in my case, what am I talking about when I say value? Well, I'm going to say it's stuff, right? It could be, it could be, you know, clothes moving from a manufacturer through a supply chain to a store. It could be an idea moving from um, moving from the, the head of a product owner into working software and production. I, I, you know, I'm going to argue that if you squint, you know, physical and products and knowledge work, they're pretty much the same thing. Um, what, what we're talking about in, in terms of value is taking some form of raw material and turning that raw material into a thing. But then when we look at our organisations in general, how long does stuff take? You know, we look at most big, bigger organisations or organisations as they scale, and it tends to take a very, very long time to get stuff done. And this is a value stream map from a large organisation in the UK that I worked with some time ago. Um, I like to show this because... Uh, it, it sort of it shows in in essence the, the sort of the mess the tangled mess that we can easily sort of get into as an organization grows up if you like or adds more adds more people adds more scale and in this we can see um, we can see there's a box in the middle and that box in the middle that says the world of integration there is a tiny sticky note in that which is someone writing some code and all the rest of that is people talking about writing code or coming up with designs for writing code or testing writing code or integrating the code that's been that's been written. But there's a tiny bit of what in general is called the sort of you know, value adding activities from Lean right in the middle of that. Um, and it, overall that process would take months and months and months. We're talking six to nine months to get anything done in this organization. That's not really what we want when we're talking about the flow of value. You know, we want to optimize that 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 value chain as much as we can and i think that's for me where team topologies comes in because what team topologies is all about is optimizing organizational design for flow how do you create team structures team structures um, that sort of invert the usual sort of behaviors of things where you know one team might be dependent on another team to get stuff done uh, but instead of having those sort of dependencies how do you invert those and create things like self-service platform teams um, so you can, if you've read the book i won't go into all of these all the details of this um, but you have these idea of stream aligned teams um, which are optimized around you know business capabilities if you like so the processes are the streams within uh, within team topologies, these stream aligned teams around business capabilities, uh, enabling teams, and you have you know, hard stuff that needs to happen. The hard stuff does need to happen sometimes, complicate the subsystem team. And then this inversion of control process where uh, platform teams are providing self service help to, uh, to the rest of the organization. And for me, that's fundamentally what team topologies is about. And I think that's pretty much what the, the subtitle of the book is you know, optimizing organizations for flow. So that's a little bit about flow of work, you know, a bit about team topologies. What about software architecture and complexity? That was the second uh, part of the title of this talk, software architecture and complexity. I can see team topologies on the, um, on the, on the, on the thing that's going out, so I'm going to have a drink just to, because maybe it's a second one. So I'll go back to this quote from earlier. You know, the bigger we get, 
the easier it is to get bigger. As we build new products, as we advance our, uh, our infrastructure, as we increase the complexity of our software architecture, as we add new systems to our software architecture, it becomes easier to add more stuff. We, we go faster as we get bigger. Now, as I say, this is sort of contrary to the sort of received wisdom that we have, right? Which is this idea of, you know, from, myth, uh, from Fred Brooks's seminal Mythical Man Month, you know, adding manpower to a late software project makes it, makes it later. Um, because you're increasing the overhead, you're increasing the amount of communication that needs to happen, you know, things like meetings that need to happen. Um, you, you're increasing potentially comp you know, the number of people who are working in the same code base. And so, you know, you're adding complexity there. You're increasing things like merge conflicts and blah, 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 blah. Stuff gets slower when you add more people above a certain limit. I'm going to say, excuse me, five to nine people or so on a single team. So this quote from this person at Amazon, that really sort of confused me. I couldn't work out why that might be the case, or indeed if it was true or not. I kind of looked at some data around Amazon AWS's growth in particular, um, and it seems to be true. And actually, um, the new Amazon CEO showed a very similar graph to this on, on, on AWS's growth during um, the reInvent last year. And what this graph seems to show is that as the number of people that Amazon has as employees doubles, the amount of revenue they make more than doubles. So they get more revenue, more than double the amount of revenue per employee as they add people. So that's this idea of a super exponential growth, growing in advance of, of exponential or, um, or, or yeah, growing in advance of exponential. And this is sort of from publicly, uh, this is from public numbers. And that's what this exponent says, 1.15. They're growing faster than, than exponential. And how did they achieve this? What sort of things have Amazon done in order to enable them to achieve super linear growth, super exponential growth? When I think that you can go all the way back to the forcing functions that Jeff Bezos uh, put in place originally um, to try and break Amazon's sort of big monolithic structures up into smaller, smaller teams. Um, so he said, for example, teams must communicate via interfaces. So you, there's no more, you know, no more teams talking database to database. You don't integrate with someone's database. You communicate via stable service interfaces. He also sort of said all interfaces must be externalizable. So you know, um, you treat another team as if they're the enemy, if you like. You treat any other team in the organization as if they're going to DDoS you at any moment. You have to harden and your interfaces, your service interfaces should be externalizable. And you should also limit the size of your teams famously to this idea of two pizza teams. And I would argue that what Jeff Bezos did there is implement a set of constraints around the organization, in the organization, that were forcing functions for improving flow. So decoupling teams from one another by using the idea of you know, service interfaces, you must communicate by these service interfaces. You know, in, in, improving, um, de decoupling further again by saying everything must be externalizable. So we're going to protect against um, anything outside our own team boundary. And also then you know, creating these small teams where communication is much, much easier. Um, we don't have the overhead of larger teams. So I think he sort of deliberately created these forcing functions, so limiting interaction to nearby teams, um, isolating teams from one another, and then scaling by a, a, a something called Dunbar's number, which we'll come on to in a minute. So, you know, in terms of software architecture, the way, the way Amazon has grown has been via these small teams. And if you look at the AWS you know, set of products that AWS released, we, uh, to, to paraphrase an old, um, you know, um, um, uh, uh, Prag Dave joke, you know, I haven't, I don't know what new products Amazon have got today. I haven't checked Twitter this morning, you know, um, but essentially they're just churning these things out at such a rate. Um, how are they able to do that? And it's because they've got, if you like, team structure around the team topology idea of stream aligned, product aligned teams based on this self service inverted control platform layer underneath, they're just able to add more teams. If they want a new product, we'll just add a new team to build a new product, add a new team to build a new product, using because of these forcing functions that have driven, that's driven the software architecture in that particular way. So that's all kind of very well. We've got a bit of team topologies, drink, we've got a bit of microservices or you know, software architecture in there, drink. Um, 
what does that say about complexity and why am I wanting to talk about complexity and complex adaptive systems? Well, the reason I want to talk about complexity and complex adaptive systems is because I, I think that the underlying principles of complex adaptive systems are the underlying principles of the success of Amazon and of the success, a continuing success of teams organized around flow, so the team topologies ideas. So what are complex adaptive systems? Well, they came out of a, uh, an, they come generally researches from an institute in, uh, in, in, in Santa Fe, called the Santa Fe Institute, funnily enough, uh, in, 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 in the US. And this was an institute set up by a bunch of very smart, uh, sort of Nobel Prize winning physicists and mathematicians um, who were working at Los Alamos, so pretty close to Santa Fe, um, back in the sort of, uh, back in the 80s. And uh, spearheaded by a guy called Murray Gellman, who won the Nobel Prize for various things. Um, and this, the, the, the institute was set up to answer some sort of general but also specific questions, which is how does complexity arise from simplicity? How do you get when you get simple components? How do you get these complex behaviors? And if you think about you know, what, 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 what sort of simple components might be, they might be cells, um, and you get sort of things like, you know, people out of them, that's kind of amazing. Or you might have like individual houses and you get cities, uh, these very complex things, or you might have, you know, just kind of organizations and you get small organizations with people working in them and very large ones. So all of these are examples of complex adaptive systems. There's some interesting sort of ideas came out of some research by a guy called um, Jeffrey West, um, based at the, the, uh, the, at the Santa Fe Institute. And that, that research is into, uh, into the, the similarities between different types of thing. So, for example, if you look at mice and elephants, mice and elephants have a weird thing in common. Uh, as, 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 you know, as you double the size of a mammal, essentially, um, the metabolic rate of the mammal does not increase at the rate you'd expect. You'd expect as you add more stuff, you add, you need the same amount more stuff of, say, calories or energy intake in order to support the more stuff that an animal has. But actually, you don't get that. As you scale the size of a mammal, metabolic rates scale the next exponent of three over four. You only need 75% of the calories uh, as you double the size of a thing. You've got this sort of invariant thing going on here. There's another weird sort of scaling law that becomes apparent when you start looking at organizations, so companies. So if you look at like a mom and pop, like a, a news agent versus a, sort of a bigger shop versus another bigger shop, or, or then you get up to like Walmart or um, Woolworths or whatever it is, um, you'd think that as you double the size, you'd get double the revenue rate, but you actually don't. You get about 85% of the revenue rate. As you double the size of an organization, you get this, this power law. So as a, as a company doubles in size, um, you only get about 85% of the revenue. Now, you know, call back to the Amazon thing, which is Amazon gets 115% of the revenue, not 85%. So what is it that Amazon are doing that's making them buck this trend? So revenue scales with number of employees following this scaling law. And the same with cities. If you scale, um, so if, you, if you go from this, if you go from, what, the, from one urban conurbation, double its size in terms of uh, the number of people living there, um, you, you, you don't have to spend double the amount of stuff of money on infrastructure. What you actually do is you have to spend 85% of the money you'd expect. So infrastructure scales with population with this exponent of 85%. And that's for things like road length, petrol stations, restaurants, water pipes, infrastructure stuff. Um, you know, so you, you, you only need 85% of the, of, the, of the water pipes uh, as, you, as you double the size. And all of these are kind of, you know, these are these are these are, these, this, these are examples of power laws that exist in nature that have been observed. And Jeffrey West uh, wrote in the book Scale a really nice quote, I think, about science, really, which is quantities that do not change when other parameters of the, of the system change. They play a special role in science. You should be going and looking for underlying interesting stuff when you see these these straight lines. And all these ideas, all these straight lines are examples of economies of scale. So this is actually a thing, you know, our CFOs, they, they're right when they say we want economies of scale. As we double, we will get economies of scale. But they only get economies of scale for certain things. And that's the interesting fact here. So as you double the size of a thing, you can either have linear scaling. So where you, as you double one factor, you get a, a doubling the other one. Or you get this idea of sublinear scaling, which is as you double one number, you don't get double in the other number. 
So why is that? Why do we see in these complex systems these, these similar behaviours across different, vastly different domains or things? Well, it comes back to what the definition of complex adaptive system is, really. So a complex adaptive system, according to the Santa Fe Institute, complex CASs exhibit self-similarity, they exhibit self-organisation, they're complex in, in the sense that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Like, you know, you can take a, you can take a human apart into, into its con constituent cells and then smash the cells back together and it's kind of, it's not a human anymore, right? It's just a bunch of goo on the, on the ground. And you get this idea of emergent behaviour as well, some emergence. Um, and considering these, the, the, this as a compact adaptive system, so humans, things like cities, Complex adaptive systems, you know, organizations are CASs as well. Um, and looking at these three scaling laws, the similarities between them, Jeffrey West and his collaborators came up with an under set of underlying principles which 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 can sort of um, derive, if you like, these different uh, these different um, behaviors, scaling behaviors. And these behave behaviors, sorry, these principles are are, are three things: they're space filling fractal networks. Um, invariant terminating units, which are, um, for example, you know, the cells in a body or people in a city, and their optimization, so feedback. And as I say, complex adaptive systems are actually everywhere, um, and they can be described with these three principles. And the interesting thing about, about hierarchies is hierarchies like circulatory systems or information flow or, um, uh, or, 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 or the flow of water in pipes, um, these hierarchical fractal networks, you get a scaling law with a power less than an exponent less than one. If you have a hierarchy, you get sublinear scaling or you get uh, uh, economies of scale, essentially. Um, essentially, Walmart and a convenience store are pretty much the same. They're just different sizes, right? They're, they're, they're exactly the same, though, at, at when you squint. So, Interestingly, why is why do we have some of these, these these things like why does metabolic rate slow down as size increases? Why does revenue slow as size increases? So you know why do we have these these behaviours like what, what why um, uh, like revenue growth slowing or or, or metabolic rate slowing? And essentially, it's to do with it's, it's to do with the depth of the hierarchy and impedance matching at different levels of the hierarchy. There's a bunch of mass behind it essentially but for example in the circulatory system as you an artery splits into two two more arteries um they they have exactly the same cross-sectional area if they didn't you get black back pressure um pumping basically your heart will be pumping against itself that's essentially what yeah what the circulatory system does you've got a big thing at the top smaller 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 things and eventually it comes down to your um the, the capillaries that feed energy into your cells so the, the things at the bottom the capillaries in the cells are the same across all mammals um, but you know, bigger mammals have bigger, bigger hierarchies than them. So the, the blood's going to go further from the heart, if you like. And that hierarchy, the depth of the hierarchy, describes metabolic rate, or can be used to derive the metabolic rate. Um, there is a there is a, a match between the two, and that's the same for things like water flow in pipes. So water flowing into a city, well, big pipes to start with, but all the pipes in your houses are the same size, more or less. Um, and and the the thing with this, as a as a city grows in size, you have more bigger pipes coming in, but the pipes in your house is, are, are still the same, and and that explains the economies of scale. Essentially, mice and 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 the blue whale are the same, except they've just got these different depths of hierarchies. Blue whales live a lot longer than mice, though, and they experience life in a much much slower way. They've got a far far slower metabolic rate. So this is interesting, right? So you know this idea of hierarchies. Um, implies efficiency, cost efficiency. You know, bigger animals, bigger companies, et cetera, are more efficient. And this is due to this idea of the hierarchical uh, and, and impedance matching in, the, in the, the fractal networks within each of the things. And this is driven by evolution for mammals, but it's driven by feedback from market forces for organizations. Bigger companies are more efficient in terms of the amount of money you need to spend on network cable as you double in size, but as you develop more hierarchy, um, you get this 85% revenue rather than 100% revenue increase as you double. And the interesting thing is everything slows down. As you add depth of hierarchy 
things get slower. So, you know, uh, an elephant experiences life very differently to a mouse. They live a lot longer than a mouse. Um, their metabolic rate is a lot, lot slower than a mouse. Their cells age much, much, much more slowly than a mice, than a ma mice's, than a mice's, <laughs> than a mouse's uh, cells uh, age. In fact, elephants don't really develop cancer. Their, their cells age so slowly that they don't have the opportunity to um, to to you know to to develop the defects that cause cancer over time, which is a really I mean they do get some, but in general that that holds, and that's that's kind of true for organisations as well. As organisations grow, stuff slows down. So back to what we were talking about at the start, and what I think is at the heart of what we're trying to do, both with software architecture, which is you know building software systems that mean that that we can get stuff done we can optimize for the flow of value into those software systems of requirements so that we can get them into production and in terms of <clears throat> how we structure our teams in order to do that the optimization for flow and coming back to you know that value stream map i sort of showed you right back at the start from that very very large organization um you can think of that if you squint uh, and sort of you know it's a bit like if you if you've ever heard dan north tell the thing about um, you know, if you get a, a burn-up chart from, you know, an agile burn-up chart, if you sort of turn it on its side and squint a bit, it looks a bit like a Gantt chart. And you kind of, you, you have this sort of, if you ever need to report outwards to a waterfall project manager, you turn, you turn it on its side and say it's a Gantt chart. Well, this is the same with value stream maps. Essentially, a value stream map, if you squint and turn it on its side, is kind of like one line through the hierarchy of your organization or part of your organization. So this is going from you know your people having ideas in the business through, in this case, it's through architects, it's through analysts, it's through data integration, people at enterprise, people with all sorts of enterprise data and integration in their names in different orders, um, until it gets to someone doing some work with the developer, and then finally, you know, through all your testing and into production. It's essentially this, this, this sort of line through the hierarchy. You can sort of see the hierarchy in effect. Um, and what you have in these hierarchies is you have queues of work, right? You have people doing stuff. I'll do a bit of my work and I'll put it off into another queue. I'll raise another ticket over there. I'll put it off into another queue, raise another ticket, et cetera, et cetera. And I'll pick it up when, when, when I see something in my queue and I'll do, I'll do some work on it. Now, the problem is that those queues are essentially acting, if you remember I said about you know, impedance matching um, in circulatory systems, for example, is that that's, 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 but that's a, uh, an effect that stops the heart beating against itself, if you like. Um, you know, if you had blood rebounding, at the, rebounding off the split of an artery, then the heart would be pumping against itself. You'd get this shockwave going back up towards the heart, which, which is presumably bad, um, and the heart will be put under pressure and you'll get heart attacks. This is why plaque is so bad, right? And, and things like you know, the hardening of your arteries because it's gonna put more pressure on your heart because you're narrowing the arteries, which means there's back pressure back up to the heart. That's what you're doing, putting cues in, in organizations. You're deliberately essentially putting um, uh, blockages into the flow of information, the flow of stuff. and back to the start and like i said the flow of value you know it could be physical it could be uh, informational it could be sort of you know more abstract ideas you know, the stuff that we do as knowledge workers well you know the thing is with 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 warehouses and with supply chains and with factories is you get to see these cues and you get to see that they're bad because they're physical things we don't see them right because it's just bits in some computer somewhere we don't actually tend to realize that we've got all these cues <coughs> throughout the throughout the run throughout our our processes, or streams, whatever we want to call them, value streams. <clears throat> so what we're essentially saying is we've got this problem with impedance mismatching in large organizations where um, organizations, their hearts are essentially beating against um, uh, the, you know, the hearts are beating in flow of stuff is coming through, but then it's getting blocked um, because we're blocking our corporate arteries to extend a probably quite weak metaphor. <clears throat> so to summarize that you know as companies scale they have more processes and hierarchy right um, and things slow down but we also deliberately block our corporate arteries by adding these 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 cues in there um, we have to ask other teams to do stuff rather than do stuff for ourselves um 
quick sidebar. I don't know if you drink beer for teams apologies, what do you drink if you mention accelerate? Probably like a vodka or something. I don't know, who knows? Um, but I'll have water instead. I haven't got vodka. Well, it might be vodka, you know. Oh. You know, here's an interesting thing from accelerate is you know, if you think if you think about things like change request boards, you know, that's deliberately putting a halt, you know, it's, it's deliberately blocking the flow of information for a period of time. You're saying, no, 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 no. Okay, maybe you can have some stuff flow through. You know, and these are um, correlated with, I think not even correlated, I think predictors of low performance in the in the statistical sense, um, according to the restriction accelerates, summarizing accelerates. So, you know, you could think that if looking at the research accelerate, you, you can sort of argue, I think I could argue that, you know, things like the four key metrics, so mean time to recovery, cycle time, you know, change failure rates and you know the number of deploys uh, per unit time these are the equivalent of taking your corporate health you know, corporate, of, of like going to the gp and taking your blood pressure and, and a heart rate and things like that you know they can identify whether you're uh, really really sick <laughs> um, and whether you're getting better or not over time um, so you can use these things to identify the signs of aging um, as i say much like monitoring heart rate and blood pressure um, but of course, as you optimize for the four key metrics, you can only ever get as good as your hierarchy. You can only ever get as good as your organizational design and the way your teams are structured, um, because you're going to be limited by hierarchy and schedules. So the other thing that organizations do is they die. Um, and there's a, a lot of research that points now to the fact that it's because you know, you start off, you've got a great product, you go into the market, you do lots of product development, and then over time, the organization adds more and more process and constraints and stuff, and you spend less on new product development and more on not, not wasting money, if you like. You optimize the cost, cost efficiency as opposed to selling new products, and that leads to organizational mortality or um, organizations being bought or going bankrupt and so on, because you're sort of adding these, these processes and constraints and hierarchies are getting deeper and deeper and deeper, which is implying, you know, that you're going slower and slower and slower and slower. But it's not all bad for hierarchical organizations um, because you do gain economies of scale. You only need to spend 85% of the amount uh, on, on network cables or chairs stuff, I guess. Um, but you can only ever achieve sublinear growth in revenue and eventually metabolic rates of the organization will become so slow that they will they will die 50 percent churn on the markets over 10 years as a half-life of, of 10 years uh, being listed that is so that's all sucky is there anything that we can do related to software architecture and to things like team topologies team structure that can help well yes because there's there are different um different types of network that offer different types of returns. So superlinear scaling, this is when we double one quantity, we more than double the other, as AWS were doing with their revenue. Um, cities actually exhibit both of these uh, types of scaling. Um, for innovation wages and like, things like crime and disease, uh, so socioeconomic factors, you get superlinear returns to scale in cities. As you double the size of a city, you get more of this stuff, more than you'd expect. But you also get, economies of scale for the the kind of infrastructure stuff so this is why cities are so they, they seem to you know suck everything in because as they as they as they get bigger it's easier to get bigger and cheaper to get bigger um so they continue to grow and grow and consume everything around them until they're well megalopoli is that a word maybe fun fact walking speed also increases in cities this has been looked at by MIT using mobile phone data. And uh, as, as the size of a city increases, or collimation increases, people walk faster up to the limit of their legs. So I'm looking forward to exoskeletons and seeing people whizzing around all over the place. It's, it's going to be quite fun. So what's driving superlinear growth in cities? And I was having an argument hours. Well, it's social networks. It's the fact that different types of networks are acting that's driving the superlinear growth. It's the it's the communication between people um, and their proximity to one another and their ability to choose who they associate with that drives superlinear growth of, of cities. Um, I don't know if people have come across this, these numbers before. Um, I would normally ask, has anyone heard this? But you know, this is the 
this is about the, the, these are the Dunbar's and the Dunbar numbers. Um, so it was, it's not just the famous one of 150, but there's a series of Dunbar numbers about the, the, the about your trust networks essentially, the number of people that you build up, that you, the, the number of people that you trust to a particularly high degree, less degree, less degree, less degree, the number of social connections and, and how tight those social connections are. This is why we talk about teams of five, you know, as as as, as being a really great number because there's people who you really really trust. You can build up a lot, a lot of trust with them. But in cities, you know, the thing with, with cities is you get to choose who these people are. If you're in a village, the Dunbar's number of 150 people, you know, that could be the entire village. You don't get to choose who to associate with. In a city, I can go and find the software developers, or if I'm a lawyer, I can go and find the lawyers, associate with them. And you get this sort of, this network effect of, you know, increased um, innovation and patent growth and wage growth because of that, because of this association. Do we have this idea of returns to scale versus economies of scale? Just to drive these two facts, these two things home. Um, economy of scale is governed by hierarchy. So if you have a hierarchical network, you will get economies of scale for that network. So that's going to be hierarchies of information flow in organizations, as well as if we have hierarchies, as well as you know, hierarchies of you know, water pipes and so on. But then you have another type of network which is governed by social interactions. And this idea of a small world fractal, small world fractal space phone network, like Twitter is, like the internet is. Um, this idea of, um, of, 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 of nodes that are connected to one another in more than one place. And the interesting thing here is you can actually measure the health of a small world network by measuring its fractal uh, dimension. I won't go into the details of this, but you know, the idea is with, with small world networks, as they grow, they become more prinkly. The edges become more prinkly over time. Whereas with hierarchies, all you're doing is adding depth to the hierarchy. You can actually measure the health of cities using the fractal dimension of the city, of the city outline as a, as a, as a guide. Detroit's fractal dimension uh, plummeted during the sort of 80s and 90s, for example. So if you're looking at these sort of pictures and thinking, oh, that looks a lot like the idea of from team topologies, where we have like decoupled teams um, of small groups of people who, um, you know, are who only need to talk to people, you know, who are nearest to them in the, in the value chain or, you know, have uh, rely on self-service platforms. They don't have, a, have to ask people to do work. Well, you know, that's because I think these are the ideas behind the fact that, that empirically the team topologies, but, you know, um, patterns that, that those team structures uh, work for organizations. I think these are these, these this, is, this is the underlying science, if you like, behind it. And it's about information theory, it's about um, it's about complex adaptive systems and how information flows and how stuff flows. So just to to, to sort of um, just uh, to summarize, as cities grow, you get this idea of economies of scale for infrastructure, returns to scale for socioeconomic factors. Um, the other thing is cities hardly ever die. You know, that's a good thing. Um, and you also get essentially 115% of the stuff for 85% of the cost. This is what Amazon is doing. This is what AWS is doing. They're growing as a, uh, a small, a smaller fractal networks. They're getting more stuff out and putting less stuff in than you'd expect. So they're in a win-win essentially. And they're doing that because of the way the software is designed and built because their ability to actually get stuff done is super, super quick. You know, they've optimized for flow using these forcing functions we talked about earlier. I would argue actually that ThorWorks in some senses does this as well. You know, we, op we optimize for, we scale via markets. We have new offices. Generally, that's how we, 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 we do grow our offices as well locally. But for example, in the United Kingdom, you know, we've got Manchester and London, and we've now opened Newcastle in the north of England as well. So um, scaling by adding new, new bits on the side, if you like. Um, you could argue the Spotify model is exactly the same thing as this, you know, Spotify and team topologies, you squint and look at one and then squint and look at the other, they're practically the same if you really, um, and then if you look at, for example, Valve, Valve, you know, publicly came out and said, we want to scale via a small world network, and then going back, uh, going back to the original point I was making, which is Amazon, you know, Amazon scaling with this super linear 1.15, you know, in advance of, of exponential scaling. So Amazon, as most companies get bigger, 
it gets much, much harder to get bigger, right? Because you're adding more hierarchies as you get older. You're um, oh, just watching the. Maybe it's because I'm a long way away, but the slides are taking quite a while to change on my screen. So I'm going to put the fourth wall. Um, as, as, as most companies get bigger, it gets harder. But for Amazon, it's getting easier. And for other companies, as you scale, when you're adopting certain patterns and practices, whether that decoupled you know, microservice style architectures where you're organizing around things like business capabilities, which by their nature are decoupled from one another and stable and contain you know, these, these value streams. Um, whether you're deliberately organizing using the ideas from, you know, from team topologies. Um, so these four different types of teams optimize for flow of change. You know, um, these kind of organizational designs and, and therefore software architectures, um, they are optimizing for essentially for flow. Um, and that's kind of going back to the start, uh, the whole kind of thing that we really want. So, you know, componentization via services, products, not projects, organized around business capabilities, decentralized governance, all this stuff, I think, relies on this underlying science of complexity, complex adaptive systems, and how complexity increases or decreases, or how value increases or decreases as things change in size. Um, you know, as with growing, you can use the ideas from, uh, from team topologies to understand how best to grow by adding uh, more teams into small world, small world social networks. So finally, social networks, they imply super exponential growth. You know, hierarchies, they slow metabolic rates. If you're in a hierarchical organization, you, things are going to be slow, and they're going to get slower as you add more hierarchy. That might be good. You need some level of hierarchy. You know, mammals need some level of arter arterial blood flow um, to get stuff to the capillaries. You, need, you just want to minimize it, and then you go really, really fast like mice. I, maybe that's a weird conclusion to come to. Um, also, you know, this idea of inversion of control for teams from team topologies. You know, this idea, the idea that you know, for, for a platform team, you don't have to ask the platform team to do stuff for you. Right? The platform team offers you a way to do it yourself. You're inverting the relationship between different teams. Um, and that's going to massively improve, improve flow. Um, and then think about these forcing functions for flow. You know, what are, are there forcing functions you can you can implement in your own organization, much like Amazon did, to force teams to act in a particular way, to force them to build software, their software architecture in a particular way, and their systems in a particular way. So I'm going to stop there. I'm a couple of minutes over, I believe. But all of this stuff is in these books that um, you'll have access to when we share the, the, the deck at a later point. So team topologies, drink. You're allowed to drink beer because it's the end of the day. Drink. Accelerates drink. <laughs> uh, scale, Quark and the Jaguar, and the principles of product development flow, um, which I haven't got another drink to drink to, but I should. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure being here, and I hope that was fun and interesting. Thanks very much, James. That was very good, very epic. Uh, I personally see quite a significant difference between a mouse and a blue whale, but maybe that's just me. All <laughs> right, questions, questions. So team isolation seems counterproductive though, like making silos instead of collaborating. So referring to AWS, how is that a good pattern? Well, it depends. Again, it depends what you're optimizing for. Uh, I like to tell a story here. Uh, there was someone, oh, it was, it was, it was on record. Um, it was Adrian, Adrian Coproft, who's formerly Netflix. He was there. Um, uh, he was the cloud architect when they moved from monolith to cloud native and, you know, all the good stuff with the open source happened. And he was talking at, um, we were chatting with actually, <laughs> I'm a terrible name dropper, with Mel Conway of Conway's Law um, at an event. And so the three of us were having a conversation. And with some others as well. We were talking about the uses over the years to which we we put Conway's law. So how how it informed our working sort of lives and, and how we sort of deal with deal with stuff and think about things. And so you know, um, Adrian was talking about how at Netflix, what you do is what they did was deliberately sit physically teams from different parts of their software architecture in different in you know according to Conway's law. So they had like a bunch of UI teams. And the UIs need to talk to the platform API, which is essentially the kind of back end for front end pattern, whatever. It's a sort of similar thing. Um, so they, they need to talk to them. Well, that's great. They don't need to talk to any of the microservice people because they're miles away. Um, 
you know, because they just need to know what the, the platform API is doing. Um, so the microservices people are sitting the other side of the building and never talk to the UI people. They don't need to. Um, but the platform people do sit next to the microservices people because they do need to talk to them. And so they have this optimized um, communication um, between the parts of their software architecture that they know needs to collaborate and needs to collaborate more closely. And I talked about this in a talk a little while ago when I was going a bit more depth into business capabilities. And I was talking about you know, the idea of like, um, uh, you sit people close together if they have, you sit people according to the bandwidth that they need to have in, in terms of communication. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm, if I need, to, if I need to interact with a team because the, I, that my software interacts with their software, probably sit me next to them um, because then we can, we can discuss, you know, serendipitously, serendipitously discuss stuff, change, you know, how to do contracts and that kind of stuff. You know, but if there's a team that I, I really don't need to interact with and they're building software that I don't need to interact with, but well, I don't need to, I don't need that sort of communication bandwidth with them. Um, so yeah, that's, and it's, this is also related to, there's a guy called Thomas Allen who did some, who wrote, wrote a PhD thesis, his PhD thesis, thesis was on how information flow drops over distance. So I think it's about eight meters. Well, after about eight meters, the chances of you having a, like a, a serendipitous conversation with a person about a, a work topic drops to zero essentially. So if you you know if you want if you want people if you, if you don't want people to talk to each other, sit them for a long way away. Um, and this is you know going back to you know Sam always talks about the idea with microservices. If you're outsourcing or if you've got teams in different parts of the world, then you you better have them working on separate parts of your software architecture. Because you know, they're not going to talk. It's much harder to get people a long way away to talk to one another than it is if you if you're if you're sitting co-located. So I'm I'm sort of advocating silos, yes, but I'm advocating silos of product teams delivering with everything that they need in that team to get stuff their software into production and sit them next to the other teams that they need to talk to on a daily basis. That's what I'm advocating. If that makes sense. Totally makes sense. Is there a tea room factor though in that eight meters? Oh, yeah, well, I mean, that's the thing. If you look at, you know, um, there's a brilliant company I work with in, um, good question, Michelle, there's, there's a brilliant organization called Redgate. They make database software. So a um, brilliant, amazing learning organization. And they completely rebuilt their, their head office to put a canteen at the heart of it. So they're organized by product teams. They've got like 10 or so product teams that are, you know, that are working on independent product lines. Um, but then they all come together at lunch and all sit and share they break bread together and, you know, the boards will be sitting there. So the CTO and the CEO are breaking bread with the devs talking about stuff. So um, absolutely, you have to factor, fact, the best organizations absolutely factor that in, make it the hard what they do. I like that idea. Next question from Martin. Is there a relationship between forcing functions and fitness functions in the context of software architecture? If there is, then what is it? One over, no, I don't know. Um, it's, I mean, it, yes. I mean, I, I use forcing function as a, as a shorthand for, you know, a constraint, something that you're putting in place to guide um, things in a particular direction. Then the thing with fitness functions, and I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to get this exactly right. Um, I'm actually on a call with Neil uh, and Rebecca after this, so I'll ask them. Um, but I think with forcing functions, the key thing is that you can test them in some way. So, you know, you, know, you want to be able to, with architectural fitness functions, say around things like performance or indeed, you know, things like, I don't want this layer to talk to this layer, or I don't want this, to, you know, this bit of software to talk to that bit of software. You can encode that in a test and put them into a, um, you know, into a build pipeline, essentially. You can run that and make sure that the fitness function is passing, uh, that the tests are passing, rather that you are satisfying the fitness, fitness function. I think when I'm saying forcing functions, I'm saying more like guardrails, you know, like the Netflix idea of guardrails. Can, well, what can we put in place that makes, you know, teams think twice about doing something that we, that might be suboptimal in a particular situation? This is, my, my Welsh accent kind of situation. There you go. Can I have it? There you go. Yeah, drink. So yeah, there is a relationship, but I think that, I mean, I'm, with forcing function, I'm, I'm using them more as a set of constraints or a set of, guardrails that you put in place as opposed to sort of almost executable um, fitness architectural fitness function. Thank you. Next question from David. If small teams are the arteries that carry flow through the organization, is shared culture the DNA that instructs them to work 
to the same aim, if not necessarily the same way? Uh, um, I probably need to go away and think very deeply about that. Um, but I mean, potentially, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, teams, I guess, are, it's the individuals really that you know, the individuals doing work um, in, in organizations that are the, that, that are the, uh, that are the, 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 the invariant terminating units, which is what complexity science that talks about at the bottom of the hierarchies, if you like. Um, I don't know. I don't know. You stumped me. I'm going to say I don't know. And I'll, 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 ask, I'll answer that next time. All right, I'll hold you to it. Everybody take notes. Next time we see James. Next question's from Martin. If different systems have different system optimizing goals, then under what circumstances is it a good thing to design a monolith? Brackets, sorry, leading question. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, there's so much going on in my head around designing monoliths these days. I mean, so I don't, I, I genuinely can't remember the last time I, I visited an organization where they were building non monolithic software anymore. Um, I, I've visited lots of organizations recently where they've, where they've got monoliths and they're breaking them up or they're throwing them away or they're starting to build new software and they're starting off with this idea of product teams that everyone's jumped on team topologies and they're looking at things like domain complexity and you know how you separate domains out into different teams and these kinds of things uh, but i can't recall i don't even so i'm going to say just don't build monoliths anymore fair enough you hear it here first folks <laughs> Excellent. Well, you know, we'd expect no less from the uh, the guy talking about the microservices, right? And also, Michelle, um, I'm doing a special offer, discount. If you if you buy 10, I'll give you 10% off. 10 microservices, 10% off. Fantastic. <laughs> is, is the demise of the hierarch hierarchical organization inevitable? When you recognize the signs of decay, how can you avoid it? If you say transformation, I am drinking. <laughs> if I put digital in front of it, you have to do a double like that. <laughs> have to do a double. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think I think the accelerate the four key metrics are really interesting from the perspective of you know early diagnosis, right? You can go, well, we're really really slow. Well, we had a conversation about this internally, you know, um, because I mean, the, the four key metrics are interesting, but but they're interesting because they you know that you can get some accuracy over them from them. But what you don't want to do is 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 go into like too much precision and, and worry too much about am I measuring four key metrics exactly, um, and then and then I'll optimize. Actually, it's better to go finger in the air, kind of like you know, just just roughly take my 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 blood pressure and my and my pulse. How am I doing? And then how can I work to optimize um, optimize the constraints away? Um, Dan North talks a lot about this in terms of transformation drink. Um, don't you know? Start where you are. Essentially, start find out where you, what's you know start where you are find out what's going on looking at things like lead time and, and these kinds of like you know these kinds of metrics and then look build a value stream map look where you can remove um remove constraints look where you can remove cues look where you can optimize uh, you know improve cadences of meetings in order to optimize flow and probably what you'll find is just by doing that it's those simple things you'll get a, huge, a hell of a lot faster or you will get a lot more done you know you will improve throughput just by removing constraints from the system that you're in um so yes i would say so look at some of those metrics um because i think they're important don't 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 become fascinated by them um and look to look to optimize them i think dan's got a lovely phrase he uses which is work teams should work to safely and sustainably reduce lead time to thank you i think that's quite a nice sentiment all right last question how do companies handle compliance requirements without it being a blocker or leading to slowdowns yeah that's a great question actually and i mean there is no simple answer actually right so one thing is shift left i mean 
I don't know, I'm probably drinking, <laughs> drinking another type of thing by saying shift left. Right? But 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 really, we're seeing you know every time we produce, we, we publish a tech radar, there seems to be another as code thing happening. So whether that's you know su software supply chain verification as code, or whether that's you know policy as code, who can make changes in production, blah blah blah. Whether it's you know security scanning as code, all these things are now becoming um, part or you know are becoming executable and trackable as fitness functions if you like so you can put that you can create these fitness functions around compliance around regulatory requirements and you can you can execute them automatically as part of your your bill pipelines and i think that's a far that's that's a far better way of being compliant if you like or it's far safer from a compliance and regulatory perspective to have a computer doing it for you rather than have us messy humans with our you know fat thumbs that i can't even type the right emoji in half the time you know so um, that 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 for me would be would be uh, how to deal with it.